Well, the exhibition as a whole is called Tibet's Secret Temple, and the meaning of that is the heart of the exhibition is a set of extraordinary 17th century murals that served as a visual encyclopedia of the path to enlightenment for the Dalai Lamas from the end of the 17th century. A kind of introduction to an extraordinary world of how the human body serves as a vehicle for self-transcendence. These extraordinary set of murals preserve the knowledge of uh, meditation and esoteric forms of yoga and they were kept secret for centuries. And also during the time of the sixth Dalai Lama they were also considered secret because they were not always in conformity with the prevailing monastic forms of Buddhism. And so what we've done in this exhibition is try to bring out through facsimiles and reproductions of the murals a kind of introduction to an extraordinary world of how the human body serves as a vehicle for self-transcendence, which is often, as we know, even in the Western tradition, sort of quite opposite from what we think of sometimes as the spiritual path. Religion is often seen as somehow contrary to the worldly life and spirit and flesh, all these kinds of divisions. But in the tantric Buddhist tradition of Tibet, it was really the body that became the vehicle for experiencing the full expanse of the human spirit. When we think of Vajrayana, or Tantric Buddhism in Tibet, they always describe it as having outer, inner, and secret levels of understanding. It's also there implicit within the architecture of the Lukang temple itself. So the murals are representing, you could say, the secret level, uh, the secret understanding of the most esoteric Tibetan Buddhist teachings. But in order to be able to encounter them, in order to be able to experience them, you really have to go through the outer and inner levels first. So essentially the exhibition is using that model by introducing us first, as we are in this room, to the architectural and geographical context of the Lukang being on a lake behind a palace in Tibet, you know, surrounded by mountains. But without really having that understanding, we can't really relate to what these murals are trying to, to show us. And the same way, the rooms as we progress through, as it were, a kind of initiatic journey into the reproductions of the murals are leading us into inner levels of understanding. For example, we have so many uh, misconceptions in the West about what Tantra is. So we have the largest room in the exhibition devoted to Tantric Buddhist art as a way of really bringing a greater understanding of to what really the envisionary development that was reflected in the efflorescence of Tantric Buddhist art, Vajrayana as we call it, the diamond method, a more direct way to enlightenment that was not about asceticism and renouncing the world, but about integrating all experience onto the spiritual path. Because of the esoteric nature of the murals and of the temple itself, which we see in a sense before us here as this great mandala, even to experience the murals in their original context, you had to go across the waters in a small yak skin coracle to get across to a little island in a lake behind the Dalai Lama's Potala Palace in Lhasa. And then you would go up through ascending levels of floors within the temple. And only at the topmost floor that you could reach through a trap door onto an enclosing balcony, you would enter into a room, one half of which were surrounded by murals, and the other half was a practice space where the Dalai Lama both could meditate and practice these esoteric yogas. And in that sense, what we see before us on the top floor is that recreation in this model of that kind of space. And so this was an architecture, if you will, not just representing a practical space of seclusion and sanctuary for the Dalai Lamas, but it was also very much a symbolic architectural space representing the ascending levels from matter to spirit to light, which was literally what the murals are showing. It was also a centering device. So what we see here in this mandala form is a kind of microcosm of the universe itself. One of the wonderful things about the Lukang Temple is the different ways it can be related to by different people. And it's something we also tried to reflect in the exhibition itself. So when we talk about these outer inner secret levels, what we see here is a very graphic representation of how this is reflected within the architecture of the Lukang Temple itself. So on the ground floor is where you'll still see many, many pilgrims uh, coming today. 
to make offerings to these uh, serpent spirits because particularly as farmers in Tibet, it's very important that they have a, a very harmonious relationship with the cycles of nature. And so they'll actually bring sometimes small pieces of land, of earth, uh, from, from their farms and they will make offerings on it and they'll put it in the water, let it circulate around the temple, but they also come directly into the lower floor to make offerings to these anthropomorphic representations of these, these energies, if it were, of the deepest psyche. This next level, reached through a set of stairs that come here, is a level that's showing a Tibetan opera that's based upon a kind of heroic journey into the world of the Nagas in order to reveal what was called the wish-fulfilling jewel. So here we have you know, first, this very kind of primary animistic level. The second level is a kind of mythopoetic um, drama about the journey, as it were, into the unconscious mind to bring up the treasure of knowledge in the form of a wish-fulfilling jewel. And then only when we go up to the stairs on the back side, come onto the surrounding balcony, and we enter into what was the private meditation chamber, uh, for the sixth Dalai Lama around 1700 do we come into the set of murals which is introducing a whole nother level of experience and these were basically techniques forms of meditation and yoga in order to enter into the autonomous nervous system the things that actually were, are happening by themselves but to bring conscious awareness into the depth of the psyche and through that to bring about a transformed experience of, of nature and reality itself and at the heart of that room was a thousand arm image of the Bodhisattva of universal compassion because it's at the heart of this tradition is that if you start practicing these tantric yogas without the motivation and orientation of compassion and undertaking it for the benefit of all beings, then it can lead to certain forms of psychic inflation, um, psychological disorientation, and not helpful. It's also interesting when we look at the architectural design, when we see this kind of protuberance on the top floor and this set of uh, windows on this side, this is facing south. So although we have the murals over here on three walls, it was this section on the top floor of the Lukong Temple that was actually the meditation chamber for the Dalai Lamas. And there's still the original firebox. It was the, the meditation box that was used by the Dalai Lamas in order to generate the inner heat, to generate the kind of clear light experiences that were, <clears throat> in a sense, induced through the practice of these physical yogas. And in front of that was an entire space where he could actually engage in the physical yogas that we'll see are illustrated on the walls of the temple. And particularly uh, when we get to the visionary uh, forms of yoga that are also represented in the murals, the light coming in through this lattice work is reflected you know, even what we see uh, depicted in the murals as this kind of visionary uh, displays on a lattice work which is induced through these practices. The word Lukang literally means the temple of the serpent spirits. It traces itself to a visionary experience that the fifth Dalai Lama had during his meditations, during the construction of the Potala Palace. It's said that one of these Lumo, or literally the sort of female Naga or serpent spirit, came to him during his meditations and complained that their natural habitat beneath the mountain where the Potala Palace was being built was being disturbed by the digging into the earth, the moving of rocks, the cutting down of trees. So the fifth Dalai Lama vowed that when the Potala Palace was finished that he would build a um, small temple dedicated to these pre-Buddhist elemental spirits of nature. So this is really what the Lukang temple in its original conception was about. The fifth Dalai Lama passed away in 1683 before that vision could be fulfilled, but the governor of Tibet at that time, Desi Sangi Gyamso, fulfilled the vision during the reign of the sixth Dalai Lama and created a temple not only dedicated to the spirits of nature in the form particularly of these these sort of thonic snakes, if you will, but representing the sort of ascending levels of um, Buddhist doctrine. So we have first this reverence that's given to the earth, to the ground of our experience, and then the ascending levels going right up to, the, to this efflorescence, if you will, of human spirit. So what we see here are some examples of how this serpent energy is represented in Eastern art. Patanjali is most known as the compiler of what are known as the Yoga Sutras. So really at the foundations of our modern understanding of what yoga is, was this figure Patanjali. We don't know exactly when he lived. It's been anywhere from the second century BC to the second century AD. But what's unique in this image 
is he's shown with his hands in prayer in front of him, but the lower part of his body is a coiled serpent. So what that coiled serpent is representing is not that he was some kind of a shape-shifting human figure, sometimes snake and sometimes human, but in fact it's representing something at the heart of tantric yoga, which is called kundalini, which has often been translated as the serpent power, the serpent energy. But what it's really representing is a pre-conscious power and energy and intelligence, if you will, of the unconscious mind. That when this is activated through the tantric yogic practices, working with the breath, working with the body, it erupts into consciousness and our experience of life and reality and of ourselves is transformed. We see it in the image next to it with a serpent in the clutches of this celestial eagle or Garuda. So always in the um, Eastern tradition, not only in Tibet but throughout Indonesia, this relationship, you could say, of the subconscious, unconscious forces of nature represented by the snake and the celestial conscious spirit associated with the soaring celestial eagle with horns representing the bringing together, you could say, of what's above and what's below into an expanded experience of human being. At a more esoteric level, these same spirits of nature, of the landscape, were understood to be energies also within our own subconscious minds. And so when we see tantric yoga, one of its core practices in its Hindu form is the arousing of the kundalini, this coiled serpent at the base of the spine, which basically breaks open the chakra system, bringing about this transformation of vision and experience and a kind of transcendental, transpersonal relationship to, to the phenomenal world. And so this is also at the core of the Tibetan yogic practices, which we call tumo. Tumo was a, uh, or this fierce heat that it's called. It's about using the body in particular ways, working with the breath to arouse this energy within, which is a direct translation from the Sanskrit chandali, this kind of inner fire, which is directly connected to the serpent power of kundalini. So this is the way we sort of can look at it from the one hand, as exoterically, as a, as a sanctuary for, for these kind of atavistic energies of earth and psyche, but on a more esoteric level, it's about how we actually engage the autonomous nervous system to bring about a transformation of the conscious mind and awareness. The whole vision of art in the Buddhist tradition was never just for art's sake. Art was a vehicle. It's one reason why the art was always anonymous, which in a way is really the whole idea behind it, which is that we, in a sense, lose ourselves in the aesthetic experience, and through that discover a dimension of being which is beyond the usual range of our concerns and preoccupations in the everyday world. So art, in that way, literally becomes a door. So what we see in this extraordinarily beautiful object of the uh, Naga King, the Nagaraj, it's called in Sanskrit, is a beautiful example of the merging in Tibetan culture of aesthetics, of art and symbolism and spirituality. It's this Naga King who was supposed to have kept the sutras of the Prajnaparamita, the perfection of wisdom, which were revealed only about the third century AD and which became the foundation of all later Buddhist and tantric Buddhist traditions. If we just look at the aesthetics alone, we see this gilded object with inlaid semi-precious stones. We see the element of the snake, the serpent symbolism, only in this crest of snakes on the top of the head, whereas what we see in the face is almost an androgynous, beautific image of human nature being expressed in this gesture of offering with one leg in the earth and the other foot raised to the sky, bringing what's above and below into a kind of a renewed conjunction. So in other words, it's as we go into the depths of our human experience, this is where the jewel of knowledge emerges from. And the sharing of it, the aesthetic experience that practitioner would have in relating to it, being a way of affirming the kinds of practices that they would be doing, which is the, it's this valorization, as it were, of the subconscious depths of human experience. The sixth Dalai Lama led an extraordinarily unusual life. He was very, very different from any of his predecessors or any of the later Dalai Lamas. So he was enthroned at the age of 13 and made the temporal and spiritual leader of all of Tibet in the middle of his sort of pubescent adolescent age. Up until that time, 
he did not even know what his future role was going to be. So what happened in the building of the Putala Palace in uh, 1683, the fifth Dalai Lama died before the palace was completed, and so the governor of Tibet at that time, Desi Sangi Gyamso, had to actually hide the death of the fifth Dalai Lama because he felt that uh, the whole construction process might just suddenly be brought to an end. In the meantime, he identified the sixth Dalai Lama um, and sort of, again, kept him in training, but it wasn't really clear what his role was going to be because at this time, the whole situation in Tibet was quite unclear. So when he was finally enthroned at 13, brought to Lhasa, made the temporal and spiritual leader of Tibet, he lived a very different life. He didn't have that kind of strict monastic training early on. And when you think about the top floor of the Lukang Temple being his private sanctuary, and when you see that in these murals are represented tantric practices, you see one whole wall dedicated to these progenitors of the tantric Buddhist path, none of whom are monks, none of whom are ascetics. They're all deeply engaged with, with um, what would seem to be worldly life. And they found that this, in, in all of their songs of realization, are about how the spiritual path is most quickly achieved, not by abandoning those things to which we're attracted to and those things we desire, but by integrating them onto the path taking the body as the path, taking desire as the path. So the sixth Dalai Lama, unlike any of the early other Dalai Lamas before or after him, gave back his monastic robes and he refused to become monk. And he lived a life of a, uh, of a poet, spent his time shooting archery in the back of the Potala Palace, but writing beautiful love poems. He is completely revered within the Tibetan tradition as an enlightened master, but he did not live out, you could say, this kind of monastic ideal that was otherwise expected of the Dalai Lamas. But this in no way diminished the faith that the Tibetans had in him, and nor does the current uh, 14th Dalai Lama say that in any way this was anything other than it should have been. In fact, the 14th Dalai Lama said something very interesting. He said, at that time in Tibetan history, it was actually appropriate that the role of the Dalai Lama go back to a hereditary uh, kind of kingship model rather than one based on reincarnation. So he said what was meant to have happened is that the sixth Dalai Lama should have fathered a son who would have become the next Dalai Lama. But because all of this was kind of political heresy at the time, the sixth Dalai Lama was kind of removed from office, as it were, at the age of 22, and went on to sort of have a mysterious life thereafter. We don't really know what happened to him. Outer accounts say that he was kind of sent off to Beijing and died en route. We don't know. But there are also the official story in Tibetan uh, history as he went on to have a secret life for another 40 years and ended up living out his life in a place called Alakan in Mongolia. This is a contemporary painting uh, by probably the most renowned contemporary artists in Lhasa today. So we included it in the exhibition simply to try to show that this is a living tradition and that the ways in which these traditions are represented is going on through its own kind of transformation. So we see departures from traditional Tibetan art just in the way that the Lukang temple here is represented is not particularly symmetrical. We see different ways in which these kind of visionary experiences that you see here represented in these abstract geometrical forms are different from what we see in the the Lukang murals themselves. At the top we see this particular form of the primordial Buddha represented in union with the consort representing the merging of skillful means and wisdom. And we think about the murals, all of the um, illustrations are from a particular text that was discovered by his direct ancestor 200 years earlier in Bhutan named Rigsen Pema Lingpa. And so why do we see these murals, for example, in the topmost floor of the Lukang? And the direct reason for that is although they were illustrating and depicting the most highest levels of Tibetan Buddhist yoga and meditation, they were also the direct revelation of his direct ancestor 200 years before him, who had come from Bhutan and revealed a uh, treasure text, as it was called, um, that was then later transmitted uh, to the, the master of the fifth Dalai Lama and to the sixth Dalai Lama and sort of kept this as a kind of hidden, almost secret tradition of the Dalai Lamas. Quite different from what we see in Buddhist monasteries based on a life of celibacy and renunciation.
The royal family of uh, Bhutan was very, very supportive of this exhibition because they knew that these murals actually are based upon a text revealed by their own patron saint, Pema Lingpa, in the end of the 1400s. And in this particular image created by the royal sculptor of Bhutan, we see the living tradition of Himalayan Buddhist art. Not as it was done in Tibet so much in terms of bronze casting, but this is actually unfired clay painted with mineral pigments and gold. And what we see here also is an extraordinarily humanistically rendered face based upon from one statue from Pema Lingpa's own lifetime, which was called Nyadama, means it looks like me. So when Pema Lingpa apparently saw this image of himself, he said, this looks like me, and therefore it is me. And it became this consecrated statue that has continued to be revered by pilgrims in Bhutan as a way of directly engaging with the teachings and transmission of Pema Lingpa. One of the earliest introductions, you can say, when we start hearing about these secret yogas of Tibet was actually the great explorer, uh, Alexander David Neal. And it was her extraordinary narrative accounts of her journeys to Tibet at a time when Tibet was entirely closed to the outside world. She had to go disguised, sometimes as a male monk, sometimes as a nun, sometimes as having taken on a vow of silence when her Tibetan wasn't completely perfected so that she wouldn't give herself away. So it was her incredible accounts where she talks about ways in which she saw practitioners. So her books like Magic and Mystery in Tibet, The Secret Yogas of Tibet, all of these things were things that ignited the Western imagination in the 1920s and led to a extraordinary interest in uh, these Eastern traditions that seemed to be so different from anything that we had in the West. Prabhasambhava was the 8th century tantric master who brought Buddhism in its tantric form to Tibet. Prabhasambhava literally means the lotus born and he was a tantric master who came from northern India, often seen as the northwest, and he was brought in at a very critical time in Tibet's own history by the king at a time when Buddhism just wasn't working for the people. And so the Indian master who was there then said we have to invite a tantric master, only then will we be able to actually bring Buddhism to Tibet. So he came in first actually as a kind of sorcerer and he was actually there, he had to tame all of the elemental spirits of the landscape. We'll see in beautiful images of him in the Lukong murals taming what were called the eight classes of being, the Nagas of the underworld, the Tsen of the middle world and the Gyalpo these kind of elemental beings that existed even before human beings were on the earth. So he was a transformer, he was a conjurer, a sorcerer, at the same time as an incredible philosopher and tantric master. So this is really at the heart of the murals or representing his teachings. So here we see Prabhasambhava in union with his consort, uh, Yeshi Sogyal. He had another consort in India called Mandarava and many, many others as part of his own life story. So it was about, you know, in a certain sense, serial relationships that were all in themselves illuminating, all of which enlarged and brought to enlightenment uh, to both parties and illumination. So this is a very different modeling, you could say, of relationships, and yet we can still relate to it in everyday life, you know, in our, uh, in our own lives and relationships. So yes, so it's about a joyousness, the whole way he's holding his hand, the way he's holding the mongoose and what she's holding in her hands. Again, it's just sort of these symbolic hand gestures representing unity, connectivity. It's about bringing and joining everything together, bringing everything onto the path. This is one of the most interesting objects, I think, in the exhibition. It's actually the oldest. It's from the 11th century. And it's a uh, tantric diagram from Western Tibet. So it goes back to the early transmission of the tantric tradition to Tibet. So we actually see a very layered uh, set of symbols in this modeling of a kind of intermediate anatomy and physiology in the body, which became essentially a map for meditation and for yogic practice. So what do I mean by these layers? What we see is actually a female figure. We know that because of this boar's head coming out from the top of the head. And this is actually what identifies this as uh, Vajavarahi, the tantric goddess, Dorji Pamo, as she was called in Tibetan, who is the transformed image of the self that the tantric practitioner would en envision himself or herself to be, surrounded by fire often, over using the creative imagination to overcome our self-identity. So that represents the Buddhist element within this. However, there are pre-Buddhist elements, for example. Uh, we see it in the pelvic cradle, a bow, 
and we see this uh, triangle, uh, as it were, being shot up right through the central column of the body. So this is a very powerful image in the Bund tradition. It's not described in Tibetan. And what's happening, what is, being, what is it that this energy that's being concentrated below is being shot up through the navel? And what we see here, again, are our snakes, you know, the serpent energy. We see a red and a white serpent, and in the center a golden, uncoiling serpent. So it's literally as if the bow, this bun bow, shooting up the, um, the kundalini energy, up right through the core of the body, the eruption, as it were, of the somatic intelligence of the unconscious, rising up to the heart. Here we have two inverted triangles, uh, right up to the core. And then we have this rather wonderful kind of depiction, as it were, of the brain. But sand is a kind of magical diagram using particular syllables. But what makes it particularly unusual is that this is not specifically Buddhist, it's not specifically Bun, and it actually is showing an element that was unique to uh, Shaivite uh, tantric traditions of India that you don't see anywhere else in Tibetan art, this depiction of these side channels and the central channel as serpents. So this is a very, very clear evidence that how Kundalini Yoga and the, and the Hindu tantric tradition influenced the development of these internal tantric yogas in Tibet. And then even more particularly interesting, we see behind that a swastika. We can see its elements here just kind of sticking out, but we also see it in the left hand. This was a very, very central image, both in Bun as well as in the Jain traditions that also actually trace their origins to far western Tibet, to Mount Kailash, where all these traditions actually came together. Uh, the Jain, the Hindu, the Buddhist, and the Bun. So actually what we're seeing here is a kind of map, as it were, a diagram for meditation, drawing together all of these traditions into a composite image of how we actually transform our whole sense of who and what we are uh, using this kind of symbolic anatomy up through the very axis of the body to bring about an altered perception, an altered state of being. So what we see here in this sow, it's actually not a boar's head, but a sow's head, a female pig. So in one of the forms of uh, Vajavarahi, it's a tantric Buddhist goddess, she's shown always with this uh, boar, this sow's head, female pig coming out from her head. So what that's representing symbolically in tantric Buddhism is the transformation of ignorance into illumination, into wisdom, into enlightenment. Because the pig is generally used as a symbol of ignorance, of unawareness, even though pigs are relatively intelligent animals. In Buddhist symbology, they were associated with the ignorance. So what's interesting in the whole path of Tantric Buddhism, you don't reject anything. So even though you've transformed and you've gone beyond that kind of primal ignorance of your own nature, it still remains as a kind of ornament to experience. And so we see that throughout Tantric Buddhist art, you know, even when you've transformed fear of death, you're still garlanded in skulls and everything is about including everything that is in its aesthetics. So at this same time that the Lukong murals were created at the very end of the 17th century, literally in the decade before that, the same governor of Tibet uh, had actually consolidated Tibetan medical knowledge in a form of 79 scroll paintings. And only when that work was completed did they actually begin on the murals in the Lukong Temple. So Tibetan medical tradition was very advanced. It drew upon the traditions of Indian Ayurveda, drew upon the, tradition, the traditional Chinese medicine, as well as indigenous uh, medical and healing traditions in Tibet, as well as Hellenic medicine that had actually come into Tibet through the, the Silk Route. So it was an incredible composite knowledge and it was consolidated in the end of the 1600s during the latter part of the reign of the fifth Dalai Lama. And actually this Desi Sangi Gyamso also built the first Tibetan medical college called Chakpuri, directly on the mountain opposite from the Potala Palace. So it was a real period of, of consolidation of knowledge and a way of trying to really articulate knowledge. And so what was really interesting in terms of the tantric yogic practices is that they were all based upon actual physiological, empirical processes within the body. So this was actually something that we'll see in the murals in which they're not depicting only these kind of uh, esoteric ideas about energy in the body, but they also depict anatomy as we would more customarily understand it from a Western 
point of view. And so a lot of what Tibetan medicine was about was trying to actually to bring these traditions together. And that was called Chimen. It was called literally Chu meaning Dharma or religion and medicine. So it was about medicine and meditation. How could these brought, be brought together so that we're not only just trying to reach enlightenment, but we're actually healing the body, we're transforming the body, and bringing about an optimal state of health, a transfigured state of being in which longevity, increased well-being, increased physical stamina and resistance were all part of this process of transformation. What's wonderful about the Tibetan medical system is it's extraordinarily eclectic because it actually drew consciously from so many different traditions. As I mentioned, it drew from the Chinese, from the Indian, from the Hellenic, but also very deeply from its own indigenous, burn, shamanic, animistic traditions. So you'll see even in these 79 scroll paintings, very specific paintings to deal with how do we deal with spiritual diseases provocations from these elemental beings in the landscape. So they're basically included within, you could say, the therapeutic treatments of Tibetan medicine were also shamanistic exorcisms, different ways of relieving the body and the mind of these almost sort of states of possession. And particularly, this goes right back to the very heart of the Lukong Temple because there were certain kind of untreatable, medically untreatable um, diseases that were believed to be caused by the loop, by these nagas. So if you did something, if you cut down the wrong tree, moved the wrong rock, dug in the wrong place, if you didn't appease these nagas, these sort of serpentine energies of the underworld, they would cause lots of different kinds of skin disease in particular, infertility problems. And so Tibetan medicine said these are things that we can't treat through drugs. We can't treat it through any kind of palliative. The skin disease will never go away no matter what kind of cream or ointment you might put on. So it had to be done through exorcism, a way of reconciling the spirit and the body back with the elements of the, of the landscape. And that was really the provenance of the Bun tradition. So when we talk today about holistic medicine, we can actually look at Tibetan medicine as perhaps one of the real forerunners of that tradition in the sense that it was deeply dedicated to healing not only the body, not only the mind, but actually to bringing out the fullest potential of the human spirit. And we see that represented in these 79 paintings that were made during the time of the uh, the Sixth Dalai Lama and the Sisang Yamsa, but we also see it in images like we see here. We see two dancing skeletons. They're smiling, they're joyous, they're ecstatic. It's somehow deeply engaging because it's paradoxical. We're bringing together different elements into a single image that would seem to be different. Normally when we see a skull and skeletons, we think of something morbid and something depressing, but here we see something very uplifting. This is all about self-transformation, and to do that we have to overcome all of the things that we normally associate ourselves with, and that means the physical body, that means the flesh and blood, it means the thoughts and emotions that normally define for ourselves who and what we are. Here we see skeletons. So it's this recognition that everything comes to an end. And this is something that Buddhism, of course, was based upon. Everything's impermanent, everything is uh, going to be destroyed, so there's nothing to become attached to. But what Tantric Buddhism did was actually look at the positive side of the coin, which is what this particular object in a way it's representing. It's yes, the body itself will come to an end, and yet something new and creative, something joyous, something dancing emerges out of that. So it's a very complex kind of symbolism, a complex uh, kind of tantric aesthetic, if you will, in which we're seeing dissolution, we're seeing uh, disembodiment as being a cause for celebration, a cause for rejoicing. And we see that beautifully modeled uh, in this image where the, uh, the two skeletons are actually, they're kind of entwined, they're dancing together like a couple. As you see on the left hand, he's holding a treasure vase uh, in his uppermost hand. So this is a treasure vase, meaning it's the richness of the spirit. We see in the other hand, you know, these kind of magic wands and scepters. So this is the kind of mythopoetic, aesthetic, magic realism at the heart of the tantric Buddhist tradition. could have been on a small personal shrine, could have been in a monastery temple, but it also was more likely to have been in a household shrine. And it's not a typical image. Where we see this kind of uh, image more likely is actually in the tantric dance ceremonies called cham that were performed in monasteries. It was a way of bringing in uh, the general populace into an engagement with tantric Buddhist philosophy and narrative. And so you would see figures like this 
dancing as skeletons. We'll see that in one of the other rooms when we have actual film representations of Cham. But this is actually kind of a frozen moment, if you will, in the Cham dance, which is the dance of life and death. It's a dance of, perma of impermanence, but also of perpetual creativity. And that's really what tantric medicine, Tibetan medicine, is really all about. It's about recognizing that as a natural process in our body and then extending that as a kind of embodied spirituality, a kind of corporeal spirituality. And we see that, of course, in these tantric diagrams. We see that in the whole aspect of what tantra represents, but we see it in a way very graphically represented here, whereas it's not just about focusing on what's joyous and beautiful. We have to also recognize that, you know, at the bottom of it all, we're just flesh and blood, and beyond that, we're just bones, and it's all going to come to a, a kind of brilliant dissolution. Tantric Buddhism brought back the feminine element, it brought back the sensuality, it brought back the movement and the energy into Buddhism that had been somewhat missing in the thousand years of Buddhist history. We go back to one of the earliest of the Buddhist tantras, the Hivajra Tantra, and on several instances in that text it says the yogin, meaning both male and female, must dance and sing. The yogin must dance and sing. This was really brought out as a key method, as a key path. It wasn't just that you should enjoy yourself. It was a transformation of chanting, it was a transformation of ritual into an embodied form in which the body itself became the vehicle for transformation, whether male or female. So we see this extraordinary being representing enlightened energy, not as a static sitting Buddha, but as a dancing yogini, naked except for her ornaments, symbolically representing human bones. What do the human bones represent? It just means that the sensuality that we're embracing also means to embrace everything that we might otherwise repress or suppress, which means our own mortality. And we see that actually being represented so powerfully at the heart center by this eight-spoked wheel, which is the eightfold path to enlightenment as articulated by the Buddha 2,500 years ago. So we see all of these kind of things embodied in this beautiful imagery. For example, we see this third eye in their forehead. This is also one of these energy centers that's located throughout the axis of the body. It's representing the enlightened wisdom eye that opens through these kind of tantric yogas. So we're no longer confined to this kind of dualistic three-dimensional vision that our eyes are normally constrained to, but actually this kind of opening up into kind of a more universal awareness. We would have seen here, with the, there's a whole flaming kind of uh, top knot at the top of her head. Again, we've seen that with other images in tantric Buddhist art, the whole idea of ascendancy being represented sometimes in clothing, sometimes in the way the hands or the feet are located. In this case, it's like the flame of life coming up from the top of her body through the central channel. We'll see a wonderful example of that in the Lukang murals themselves with the flame coming out of the top of the head, representing this opening of vision, the opening of being, literally right here. And we see here what would have been probably a sun and a moon, a crescent moon with the sun on top of it, representing again the union of, of duality, the union of the male and female polarities, and representing both sources of illumination, but brought together in a kind of totality at this top chakra in the body. So what's beautiful in this object is to see the Vajra. So when we talk about Tantric Buddhism or Vajrayana, the Vajra is this symbol of the diamond way or the indestructible way, the way of deathlessness. There are many different ways in which Vajra is translated but ultimately it's about the supreme direct vehicle uh, to enlightenment, not by renouncing the things of this world, but by transforming our experience of them. So we look back at how movement, how dance, how all the kind of things that were really not part of Buddhist monasticism now become emblematic of a path to enlightenment, which is completely enlarged, expanded, and extended from what it was in monasteries. So in Tantra, it's all about complementarity. It's about the union of opposites. And so in the exhibition, we try to represent this very clearly, not just within individual objects, but the relationship between objects. So when we entered this room on Tantra, we were immediately engaged by this dancing female yogini. So what we see in this object here is sort of the male counterpart to that energetic, which was the Mahasiddha Virupa. 
in this beautiful 15th century statue that was created in the Chinese court, actually, in the 15th century, at a time when there was a deep unity between the Tantric Buddhist traditions in Tibet and in China. When we talk about the outer, inner, and secret ways in which Tantra Buddhism was, was explained, there's a very interesting story about this particular figure, Virupa. So, for example, how do we account for this large belly? Why do we account for what was originally in his right hand, which was a skull cup, a drinking cup, and actually his arm, which I'll talk about later, was originally pointing up towards the sun to stop it from going across the horizon. So in the outer story of Arupa, he was actually traveling and he reached a tavern where he was drinking. And the barmaid came up and said, you know, there's no more drinking when the sun sets, so this is kind of last call. And he said, he just put up his left arm, and we'll see that in uh, an example in the murals itself, and stop the sun in its tracks. The sun didn't go down across the horizon, he drank the tavern dry and never became intoxicated and everyone converted to the tantric Buddhist path. So this doesn't mean that he was just a kind of chronic alcoholic. What it actually represented on a symbolic inner level was the fact that anything could be integrated. Things that we might consider to be toxic or hazardous or poisonous, all of that can be absorbed and integrated into the tantric Buddhist way of life. So that's sort of the inner meaning of this story, and the outer meaning, I'm sorry, the innermost meaning is that he was pointing to the sun, which meant that he was stopping the flow of energy through his body and pointing to a source of perpetual illumination, which was the sun itself. So it's again how these objects, the aesthetics, represent incredible narratives that are in a way examples in our lives, whether you were a 15th century practitioner uh, or you're a contemporary one. They somehow resonate with us. So the extraordinary aspects of the aesthetics on this particular object are really interesting to look at. First of all, it's fascinating to realize that this statue ended up in Japan and it had lost its left arm. And when it was conserved, it was put back into a form where it represented a Japanese temple guardian that would have been originally holding a kind of a staff. But actually in its original form, as we'll see in the murals themselves, he was pointing up to the sun. The other aspect when this object was conserved is that he had a meditation belt. We'll also see that it was holding up his left knee. We still see that around him, and yet when it was replaced and conserved, it's now become an ornamental object that goes around his belly, down into his, his groin, and comes around his leg. But it's no longer actually serving the function that it did originally, which is symbolically to hold his leg into a kind of meditative pose to direct energy currents through the body in a particular way to bring about an altered state of awareness. So it's again an interesting way to see how the symbology that the object had in its origins has been somewhat transfigured by replacing his arm and you can see even on his face he's almost as if he's quizzically looking at this prosthetic arm. And yet the figure remains this powerful ideal of being able to absorb everything. And the, here we see incredible details with the multiple layers of garlands around the body. This was the ornamentation of experience. This was the way that was a complete distinction from the monastic forms where you had to not only shave your hair on your head, you had to shave your eyebrows. It was a complete, you could say, trying to disembody, trying to disengage from the senses and sensory experiences, whereas what an object like Virupa here is showing us at the Tantric Masters, it's about engaging them, but engaging them in different ways. So we can drink, but we never intoxicate it, and we can stop the sun on its tracks, whether we understand that to be something, an internal process, or in fact the universe itself. The complete realization through the meditative practices of Tantric Yoga. There's a beautiful quotation from one of the earliest of the Mahasiddhas, Saraha, who said, I have seen in my wanderings great temples and shrines, but I have not seen another one as blissful as my own body. So what we see in Virupa is almost a kind of example where the body itself is adorned the same way a temple might be. So we're seeing a transition from temple to a kind of template for an approach to life, a tantric template, if you will, for a way of being in which the body is not to be uh, denigrated, not to be seen as some kind of impediment to spiritual life, but actually through its very, the richness and the elaboration, the body becomes the temple. And that's certainly at the very heart of the Tantric Buddhist tradition, is to revere the body, respect the body, bring it to its highest state of capacity and purity, and through that to recognize our true potential as human beings. 
And we see that so powerfully, as we'll see in the next room, with the whole idea of taking human bones and turning them into ornaments, turning them into aprons, making them objects of beauty, those which would in other contexts be objects of horror. So this is really the tantric way. It's about rapture, it's about terror, but ultimately about self-transcendence. It's about not excluding anything from our range of experience, but bringing it all into a renewed and expansive state of being that's fearless, that's compassionate, that's luminous, open, and engaged with life in its deepest possible way. This room that we're in now is called Tantra, embodying enlightenment. So we've moved from that world of medicine. We've actually seen how Tibetan medicine encompasses this whole idea of not just healing, but of actually transforming the fundamental human nature, if you will. So in Tantra is taking this even to the next step. We saw this tantric diagram representing a kind of uh, imaginal, uh, energetic human physiology and anatomy. And what we're seeing here is an extraordinary tantric scroll, which is actually taking that even one step further, where we see the same kind of chakra system along the body depicted differently but in this case, relating it not just to internal processes in the body, but actually relating it to the whole cosmos itself. So this is really at the heart of what is Tantra. Tantra, of course, a very misrepresented and misunderstood concept in the West, but literally if we go back to the actual word, tan, meaning to stretch, to expand, and tra, meaning method. So this is a way, the method that we use to stretch and expand our sense of who and what we are so that it transcends our normal range of awareness our normal range of sympathy, our normal range of, uh, of self-definition to actually encompass universal processes. So this particular scroll dates back to a tantra that appeared in India in the 10th century called the Kala Chakra, the wheel of time or even the wheel of the cosmos. And it was a way of reconciling human nature with cosmological cycles. And we see that beautifully aesthetically represented in this mandala. We see how the Lukong Temple itself is a mandala, a way of actually compressing the universe into a single form, into a single image. We see how that same sense of compressing universal principles is actually compressed into the human body along the central axis of the body, but we see it actually expanded here into this kind of cosmogram. We see the kind of sea, this wonderful depiction of water on the outer edge, and this wonderful sense of aesthetic flow and this idea being that the whole universe is sort of surrounded by the cosmic sea. And then again, we can look at this even in terms of medieval Western art and this sort of beautiful use of geometry to represent uh, cosmological principles. So literally the kind of intersecting circles, this vesica piscis, the fish eye that appears here, the kind of visionary experience that results in this sense, literally, when spirit and matter come into a kind of a radical conjunction, energy and form. And this is represented here in these kind of uh, different ways. Even on the back of this scroll, you have these different ways in which we can understand the relationship between the human body and universal cycles. But the aesthetics, I think, are what are extremely interesting here. Just the way that the body is pictured, this kind of squatting posture so as to show what is really the awakening of the body. It's the opening of the body. And how is that depicted? It's not depicted in a way we might in a Western art, but it's just shown that these universal principles are there. And that when we awaken to that experience, the whole way that we actually experience ourselves is transformed. And that's what takes us back to that earlier chart and diagram where we see these anatomical geometric forms is showing actually these channels of interconnectivity within the body and between these ways in which the body and the mind are actually brought into radical conjunction. What this art, this living tradition, something that was really part of our own ancestral inheritance, but we've somehow lost that in the West ever since the age of Newton. We've sort of entered into a kind of more materialistic relationship with the cosmos, the kind of mythopoetic richness, the kind of magical realism that once colored our experience of the world and of ourselves has somehow been slightly clinicalized and we've sort of lost that magic. But it's art that remains the door back into that world. So we can look at this completely on an aesthetic level and appreciate something that it's actually showing to us without necessarily subscribing to an esoteric Buddhist tantric worldview. But somehow or other, it's resonant because of course our bodies are 
in direct connection uh, to the cosmos. We know that now even from science. You know, stardust is what forms our bones. So there's something really extraordinary when we think about it in these terms, how science itself is starting to validate some of these poetic and artistic inspirations that go back half a millennium or more. Chakra Samvara, the wheel of bliss, is a central figure for all of Tantric Buddhist art. We saw earlier in the other room a historical figure of, of Padmasambhava, the 8th century Tantric master who came to Tibet. We saw him in union with the Tibetan princess, Yeshit Sogyal. We see the embodiment of a path to realization that does not renounce worldly pleasure, worldly passion, but actually brings it into the path. And we see here almost a divinization of that human act of procreation turned into a creative act of engendering the Buddha within ourselves. So in this literal sense here, we see an act of sexuality that's not a worldly passion. It's literally a way of bringing out and bringing to birth our own Buddha nature. So we give birth to ourselves in this tantric kind of ideology that's actually represented symbolically in this image. So Buddha nature was identified in the later Mahayana form of Buddhism as our own intrinsic actual being beyond our personal sense of identity, beyond the, the self, which Buddhism recognized to be a process and not anything that was ever in any way self-existent. So we see that depicted in this image particularly as this blue head of a Buddha emerging out from the top of the head of the, the male figure here. And this is basically the Buddha nature, the awakened nature of wisdom and compassion emerging from within our physical form, out of the head as it were. We see also on either side of that, we see a crescent moon on the one hand and a skull on the other. We see this kind of cosmological symbolism. We also see this image that we're always reminded of in Tantric Buddhism, that even in the midst of this kind of rapture and bliss, there's always a skull to remind us of the impermanence of it. But this is not in some kind of negative way to reflect on everything being impermanent and therefore not you know, worthy of our attention, but it's actually showing that there's this creative cycle of destruction and creativity that's inherent to existence in every form. We look at early Buddhism and we see that the Buddha recognizes this desire, this thirst for existence, that the thing that keeps us in this wheel of existence from which we never escape. Because as long as we desire something, we are in a state of dissatisfaction, of unfulfillment, because we never actually can attain everything that we desire. So what in Tantric Buddhism it's done is it takes desire as the path, which would seem to be a contradiction. But in fact, what it's doing is taking bliss as the path, what was called ananda. Because bliss is inherently non-dualistic, it's not based on subject and object. When we're in a state of bliss, there's nothing we want. We're already in a state of absolute fulfillment. So the idea was that if we can work with that quality within us, which is our own awakened nature, which is inherently blissful, when we look inward and we find that we actually don't need anything externally in order to engender that state of luminosity, of clarity and bliss that's actually inherent within our own intrinsic Buddha nature. This is an image that tries to bring us to that recognition. So although we're seeing it as a figure in sexual union, it's actually about a state of psychic integration within our own being, bringing together these polarized forces to bring about a state of ecstatic self-transcendence and what is very critical to all of Tantric Buddhism, bliss in union with emptiness. Emptiness being the openness, the lucid expanse of reality and the bliss of that. So it's not something that's dependent on anything external, but actually intrinsic to our own deepest nature. So when we think of this as a support for a kind of psychological transformation, what we're doing is we're actually recognizing this is a divine form which is not separate from us, it's actually our own nature made manifest. And therefore the egoic nature, the kind of personal self, the socialized self, the conditioned self is being trampled beneath the feet of this divine form, the wheel of bliss. So we see this figure on the right is almost like melting. We see a head pressed down. So in this, in other words, this is the crushing 
of the egoic self. The figure on the other side is representing that same kind of prostration of the ego on another level, just sort of flayed out, and then out of that arises this ecstatic dimension of experience once the ego has been sort of put in its place by being pushed down literally into the ground. They were in fact interactive forms of iconography. So they weren't, as we might think of it in the Western tradition, an icon, something that you would actually use to support a kind of belief system, a faith, to reinforce faith. They were actually to reinforce faith in ourself. They were to recognize this Buddha nature, the Buddha within us, through which the art was, in a sense, a mirror of. And so in that sense, it's like recognizing yourself. It's as if you were looking into a mirror, but seeing beyond the flesh and the bloods and the bone into this emergent divinity in which Tantra recognized that we all, we all have and we all share. This wisdom and compassion, it is our deepest nature. One of the wonderful things about Tantra is never one-sided. Even if we don't have any background in Buddhist philosophy or Tantra, we can still see this wonderful coming together of something ecstatic, rapture, but something terrifying about it at the same time. We see loving figures embraced by, by skulls. And so there's a kind of almost a cognitive dyslexia that happens in that. But that's the power of the object. And in a certain sense, this is about Tantra. So it's no longer just about rapture, it's just as much about terror. It's about trying to awaken out of our habitual slumbering sensibilities that actually keep us in this very limited sense of what life is all about. And in that sense, it's a wonderful transition into the next stage of the exhibition, which is about encountering and embracing the shadows, embracing the darkness, so as to integrate those aspects of existence that we normally suppress, whether that's love and passion, or whether that's actually the fear and terror of death and annihilation. Carl Jung, the psychologist, once said something very beautiful, which is that enlightenment does not consist of imagining figures of light, but in making the darkness conscious. So in this very graphic and dynamic image of Shinji, the Lord of Death, Yama, we can see how, in the same way that when we saw this kind of rapturous and ecstatic figure of Chakra Samvara, that even in the midst of bliss and sexual union, there was a garland of skulls, a uh, crown of skulls, we see the same kind of paradoxical imagery here. So here we see something that would ordinarily at first sight seem to be about death and impermanence, but with a full erection. So again, there's a symbology to that. It means just in the midst of death, there's also regeneration, there's life, there's a kind of arousal. So all of this is to arouse our minds. It's to arouse our minds to this kind of paradoxical nature of reality that goes beyond the kind of dualistic relationship that we normally have with it. So here we see Yama in full state of arousal with his uh, bull's head surrounded by flames, riding on a prostate bull that's crushing this egoic self. All the kind of small and diminished ways in which we imagine who and what we are. So this is basically about the encountering of the self-annihilation, but the annihilation only of this sort of lesser egoic self that allows for this expanded state of being based upon insight, based upon luminosity and compassion in which we engage the world in a far more expansive way. And the beauty and the power of the aesthetics of an object like this, which is not a painting, but actually it's embroidered tanka, so an embroidered scroll painting. And we see the same figure, again, as most of the tantric icons are, they're unclothed, they're naked, representing the nakedness of the mind. We see the same kind of chest ornament that we saw, for example, in the yogini. Often these are described as being you know, around uh, the upper part of the body and around the lower part of the torso being made of human bones and at the center a wheel representing the eightfold path to enlightenment as um, described by the historical Buddha 2,500 years ago. In this particular image it's actually a gao, which is an amulet box, but essentially representing the same principle of the heart center. It's bringing our attention to the heart because when you Speak in Tibetan tradition, if you ask Tibetans, you know, where is the mind? It's not here in the head, it's here in the heart. So this heart-mind, which is what we're awakening, the Buddha nature is not in our brain, it's in our entire being. The center of our being is in the heart. So we'll see that in the murals, for example, when we're 
the kind of visionary forms that are arising are said to arise to vision, but the eyes are directly connected to the heart. So it's literally seeing with the eyes of the heart. In the same way that the mind that's awakened into its Buddha nature, it's the heart that's awakening. The heart-mind in a kind of unity uh, that is sometimes alien to the way we think of the mind in the West, particularly in a scientific age when we associate it so exclusively with the functioning of the brain. So an image like this is a way, again, of just sort of arousing our awareness. It's a way of recognizing our own mortality, but seeing that as an opportunity to embrace a more expansive sense of being that is no longer sort of enthralled to the kinds of uh, anxieties and, and repressions that are part of everyday life. And we see that powerfully here, you know, represented in the image of Yamantaka. So Yamantaka is the emergence from death. It's the emergence from the fear of death. It's the discovery of what was called in Buddhism, even in its earlier forms, as deathlessness. So deathlessness is the enlightened state of being. It's the recognition that consciousness in its ultimate form as Buddha nature transcends birth and death. So it's this kind of icon that we see moving from Yama to Yamantaka with this efflorescence of arms, this efflorescence of heads representing this complete awakening to a transcendent state of being which is no longer kind of dualistically inscribed by cycles of birth and death and rebirth. It's actually the transcendence into what the Buddha called the deathless. So we saw in the room dedicated to Tantra was a very human form of the yogini dancing naked, dressed in the ornaments of bones, representing this kind of different approach, you could say, to the Buddhist path and to enlightenment about this full engagement with the body, full engagements with the senses. So we see that also in this Tibetan scroll painting, even more dynamically, because no longer is it just simply a human form. It's a human form, but with the head of a, of a lion, a snow lion in this case, and holding in its hand what we saw in one of the other figures, a flaying knife, and in the other hand a skull bowl formed from a severed skull brimming with blood, which she's drinking, and she's again trampling on the egoic self. So this is this very dynamic way of engaging all of the emotions, all the movements of the mind, and uh, representing it in this extraordinary iconography through which the practitioner of Tantra would imaginatively identify. So this whole way that we saw the kind of rapturous tantric deities as a way of emerging from our usual uh, forms of, of uh, self-conceptualization. And here it's almost a kind of shape-shifting, shamanistic transformation between animal and human, representing all of these kind of liberated energies of the psyche, which are often formed in um, an animal form. This is why we see the ritual dances in the tantric Buddhist tradition as often being involving masked dancers with animal masks. So we might see a bull's mask, we might see a uh, tiger's mask, we might see um, a deer, many, many different forms representing this idea that we are, again, not confined to a single state of identity, but we can actually move into different kind of imaginative identities, therefore not being constrained by any sense of a personal identifiable self, but the self being a process, a process that's transmutable and that can actually move between even species in the case of these dances. So all the energy that's available to us as a lion becomes available through these enacted practices. They're danced. So we're no longer thinking of meditation as just simply, again, sitting quietly on a, on a meditation seat. It's about bringing this into a full embodied experience and enacting it in the world. We see the same imagery that we see in all the tantric deities of this chest plate representing the awakened heart-mind, which is the Buddha nature at the center of our being, which is not egoic consciousness that we might associate with the head, but actually this heart-filledness. So when we think of mindfulness in a kind of contemporary forms, we're really talking in Tantra about a heartfulness, a fully emotive and passionate engagement with life, not a departure from it. Uh, many, many other aspects of, um, of Tantric Buddhist art represented here. We see the kind of retinue of this Singhamukha with other animal-headed forms here with the head of a, a jackal, here with the head of another uh, lion-headed Dakini, but they're all just representing the shape-shifting, uh, mutable identity at the heart of the Tantric Buddhist vision. And here, of course, are different Buddhas, um, different teachers, uh, representing the lineage and transmission through which these kind of practices were, were brought forth in Tibet and which they continued.
that fire is the fire of awakening. So in the inner tantric practices in which you might visualize yourself as this deity, you would also perform some of these very, very dynamic yogic practices. So first you would bring about this transformed sense of being. You're no longer yourself. You're a deity. Then you would do some very, very complex held breath practices. You'd breathe in, you'd hold the breath in the lower abdomen, and then you'd do these, which we also have in the exhibition, uh, examples of uh, Tibetan yoga, where you're doing very, very extraordinary movements, very different from Indian Hatha yoga, and actually with these great drops, as they were called, in order to rouse this energy up through the central core of the body to bring about this transformed experience of who and what we are. So we saw that in that early tantric diagram with the pelvic cradle being represented as a bow, an idea of this energy being driven up through the body. So that was done also through these uh, tantric uh, chulkor practices, literally what were called magical movements, in order to bring about that transformation. So you perform that with held breath while visualizing yourself as a deity, often in the form of what we see here, Singamukha. This idea of enacted Buddhist practice, so this idea of shape-shifting, this idea of becoming the other, the other being us, this was performed through mass dance rituals that were a way that monastic communities engaged with a lay population in order to bring these narratives of transformation into the, the collective psyche of Tibet and Bhutan and other places where these practices were performed. So these kind of masks, for example, that we see here, we see that they have holes, they see that they actually have, in many cases, kind of leather straps. These would be worn by monk dancers in these rituals of transformation. Uh, we have the deer, we have the snow lion, we have the bull, and the Garuda representing this kind of celestial hawk uh, representing transformation. So what we see here are uh, sort of mythological creatures like the Garuda and the snow lion, as well as things that would be common in people's experience in those parts of the world, the bull and the deer. And all of this was about transformation. So when we think about this exhibition as being a, in some ways, a celebration of the non-monastic tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, we have a figure of Milarepa, one of the most celebrated of all of uh, Tibetan Buddhist yogic practitioners. He had this beautiful set of 100,000 songs in which he celebrated his mountain hermitages. He said, let others go to the monasteries to light butter lamps. I will stay here in my mountain cave and light the butter lamp in my heart. And this actually representation of his right hand up to his ear was actually a symbol of the idea of expressing his enlightened sensibilities through song and imparting that to others in that form. So we see him, as he talked about it, he said, let others go to their uh, temples filled with, with idols and, and, uh, and shrines. I'll be here in my, my temple filled with alpine flowers and, and running streams. So with this whole celebration of the Tibetan environment and the power of the mountains. So that's the kind of songs that Milarepa here sang. And we see this wonderful depiction of a shrine created as a mountain, you see actually dancing uh, leopards and snow lions, and it's a, a wonderful evocation of the natural environment of Tibet within a, within a shrine box with, with Milarepa at its center. And this was, of course, the iconic mountain Kailash, or Kang Rinpoche, as it was called in Tibetan. This represented for Tibetans, both whether they were Bun or Buddhist, as well as for Hindus, as well as for Jains, it was the center of the earth. And this is a mountain in western Tibet uh, where Milarepa spent lots of time in his cave. So it, that's again represented here in a uh, contemporary photograph of this iconic mountain that for Tibetans was the center of the earth. It was a place in which a lot of these traditions actually cross-fertilized. It was a place where Hindu Shaivite yogis came from India for Bun, it was also their sacred mountain before it was a Buddhist mountain. And one of the great things about Milarepa, he was particularly associated with the practice of the, the six yogas, as they were called, what we've called in this exhibition the yogas of fire and light, because his main practice through which he achieved enlightenment was called the, the yoga of inner fire, of tumo. And this, was a, this is the quintessential tantric yoga. It's the kundalini, it's the chandali in Sanskrit. It's about arousing this internal energy that burns through all of the kind of obscuring mental concepts that prevent us from engaging the fullness of our being. So we see that even represented in the wall behind 
of this yogi with the long dreadlocks from eastern Tibet pressing on what were called the wind gates in the groin in order to bring these energies up through the central core of the body. So what we're seeing with Milarepa, we're seeing with contemporary practitioners following in his tradition was the engagement with these these tantric diagrams representing a transformed uh, experience of human embodiment. We've come from the room before, which was showing us the way these practices are engaged through sacred dance, the way they're engaged through these secret physical yogic practices, which are shown here in film form, ways in which we dynamically engage the body through very forceful techniques. And what we have in this room were the six yogas, where once that's done and you've opened up these channels, these currents of energy in the body, you begin to work with them internally. So that started with what were called the six yogas. And that started out with Tumo, the yoga of inner heat. That moved, that was supported and sometimes by the sexual yogas in which that heat and that energy could be increased. That led to the fire becoming light, the clear light, the luminosity of the heart-mind. You worked with that in states of sleep. There were techniques for gaining conscious awareness during the dream state, what we would now call lucid dreaming, and being able to change the narrative scripts of the subconscious mind during the dream state and be able to use that as a basis for practice. The other, the other two remaining out of the six yogas was the transference of consciousness out of the body uh, at the time of death and also a way of working with the mind meditatively and yogically during a uh, period called the bardo after the death of the body in which the, the mind was a disembodied state would go through a 49-day transit before it was born and brought back into another body. So these were dynamic forms of yoga that could be done at any stage of, of waking, dreaming, sleeping, uh, and dying. And dying. And dying. Yep. It was basically the full spectrum of life and death became the arena for, for Tantric Buddhist practice. So it wasn't anything, there was no exclusions. Every, every moment of life became an opportunity for engaging with the fullness of our being, whether we were sleeping, dreaming, waking, dying. Everything became an opportunity to bring about that illumination of the subconscious mind and to recognize that as a field of, as it was described in the tradition, luminosity, clarity, and in a way beyond thought and emotion as we normally conceive it into a more expanded sense of wisdom, compassion, and universal empathy.